our erstwhile <laughs> caucus chair sitting patiently. How did you get back quicker than me? But I want to say uh, hello and good afternoon to all of you. And this is the Subcommittee on Management, Organization, and Procurement of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform. So I'll now call you and myself to order. Okay. I understand that the University of California. Oh, let me see. Written statements. Okay. Okay. Without objection, the chair and the ranking minority member will have five minutes to make opening statements, followed by opening statements not to exceed three minutes by any other member who seeks recognition. I'd like to welcome you to our first subcommittee hearing this session on the roles and responsibilities of the Inspector Generals in the financial regulatory community. As the chairwoman of the Subcommittee on Management, Organization, and Procurement, I look forward to working with Ranking Member Bill Bray and the subcommittee members uh, <coughs> to ensure that our federal bureaucracy is both effective and efficient in carrying out its responsibilities. And I welcome our witnesses, especially my colleague, Congressman John Larson, and look forward to hearing your testimony. Today's hearing could not come at a more critical time for our panel. As our financial markets continue to struggle with mounting losses and insufficient capital reserves to meet the credit needs of our domestic economy. And as we begin to implement newly established market stabilization programs across the financial regulatory community, we must also look ahead to ensure that our financial regulators have an effective inspector general component as part of their agency's operation. Personally, I believe no regulatory or market structure reform will prove successful if our market regulators lack an independent and objective IG to oversee their activities. The role of inspectors general is an essential one for ensuring that our federal agencies function both effectively and free from undue political pressure or conflicting interests. These pervasive elements far too often creep into the culture of our agencies, therefore, compromising the very programs and staff that are charged with overseeing and enforcing the rule of law throughout the marketplace. In order to achieve this goal, we must ensure that our IGs are fully independent in their activities while also ensuring that they have adequate resources and legal authorities necessary for carrying out their duties. These elements <coughs> are critical if we are to have faith in the regulatory mechanisms established to protect investors from reckless and fraudulent investment practices. Last fall, Congressman Cooper worked to enact the Inspector General Reform Act of 2008, which provided significant improvements in the authorities and responsibilities granted to agencies, the I G's and for carrying out their duties. These include new law enforcement authorities, increased budget autonomy, a unified government-wide IG council, and additional reporting responsibilities to improve agency transparency. Today, however, many IG's are still appointed by their agency heads or commission chairs, thus opening some IG offices to potential conflicts of interest with the same agency leadership they are charged with overseeing. While this is a complicated issue with valid points on both sides, I believe it's one that merits a serious discussion in order to ensure the independence and reliability of agencies' IGs. So today, I hope that our panelists will be able to discuss their efforts to ensure 
that our market regulatory functions are being carried out efficiently by our agencies. Part of this must include how agency IGs are coordinating with the newly established special IG for the troubled asset, <coughs> excuse me, assets relief program known as the SIG TARP in order to ensure that program funds are being spent appropriately and in accordance with the law. I'm also hoping to hear about their ongoing activities to investigate where market regulators have failed in overseeing the very institutions that now require nearly $1 trillion in government assistance in order to remain viable. Furthermore, I look forward to hearing from Congressman Larson on his legislation, H.R. 885, the Improved Financial and Commodities Markets Oversight and Accountability Act. This bill would designate the IGs of several key financial market regulators to the level of presidential appointments, therefore removing agency heads from having any role in the appointment or removal of an IG from office. So once again, I want to thank our panelists, and I want to thank the members for coming today to join us, and we look forward to their testimony. And at this point, at this point, I'd like our co-chair, the minority leader, uh, and you will have about uh, three to five minutes. Yeah, take your time Matt. for your statement. Madam Chair, I will, <clears throat> I'd just like to ask that my um, uh, opening statement be um, introduced into the record. And let me Without just- Without objection, so move. <clears throat> thank you. And so uh, to get to the testimony as quickly as possible, let me just say that um, I appreciate you holding this hearing. And I'd like to thank the Congressman for bringing his basically drafting this bill, because I think it's really critical that now's the time we take a look at this whole issue. I mean, since the act was originally in, uh, initiated in um, 78, uh, back in the olden days where some of us were young and just getting into politics, um, it's time that we look at this very uh, periodically to make sure the good intentions that we have tried to wreck in the past are actually working, especially now at a time that bailouts, you've got um, rescues, you've got big spending, the inspector generals are absolutely essential. I mean, if there was any concern <clears throat> uh, in the past of when and where and how public funds are being used, right now the public has a hypersensitivity to it, and for good reason, because of just the sheer numbers and the long-term impact that inefficiency can have. Um, I just, I just like to say that this, though, is an issue where we always talk about it, not Democrat, not Republican, or whatever. Um, that's all great and abstracts, but this is one issue where we really don't know where the answer is. We need to probe, and it really is an example where politics is more of an art than a science. It's not as exact as a lot of people like to think. And I hope that this hearing is the beginning of that probing to find where is the fine tuning, where is the nuance, where can we improve the system. And I think the Congressman has one proposal that we need to look at seriously um, and then compare it to other options along the road. And I really think that uh, a hearing like this is exactly how we could do it. And I gotta say, Madam Chair, I think a lot of people have been concerned that in crisis, we do things quick, not well, and a lot of us I know go, are going back now and saying there was a lot of things done in the, in the, the uh, recent past that wish we could go back and re revisit. Here's a chance for us to get the facts, to work together, fine tune this before we ask the, the uh, people of the United States to live with our decisions. And so I, I appreciate the, the ability to have this hearing. I appreciate the Congressman being here today and look forward to hearing all of the witnesses today so we can start that process of um, creating our work of art um, that hopefully will um, be something we'll be proud of long after we're gone, especially one to make sure that um, the voters are happy with the way we're handling their resources. And this IG issue is obviously one of those issues that really is essential for us to do right if we're going to fulfill our responsibility of being the vanguards and the protectors of, of the taxpayers' money. And I appreciate the hearing again and yield back, Madam Chair.
Thank you, uh, Congressman Bill Bray. And uh, Congressman uh, Cray R., would you like to have an opening statement? Well, no, well, I just wanted to just. Yeah. The only thing is that what, when we look at the work that they do, there's three principles in government that are extremely important. That is the efficiency, the effectiveness, the accountability uh, in government, and this is what the IGs will uh, provide. And I think that's the, the end principles that we're looking at. So I appreciate the work that you do, Madam Chair, and I want to hear from my honorable uh, friend, Madam Chair Larson. Thank you. And I'd like to call on uh, Congressman Platt time, and thank you for your leadership of this subcommittee. We appreciate the work that you do for the people. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it certainly was an honor for four years to chair the subcommittee with now the full committee chair, then as ranking member, uh, Mr. Towns from New York, and, and honored to stay part of this effort and for your hosting this hearing. Um, one of the things we saw during those four years is the importance of IGs when it comes to truly ensuring efficiency and responsible operations in the federal government. And I want to commend our colleague, uh, Mr. Larson, for, for his proposal of further enhancing the, uh, the status and the independence of, of IGs of these five agencies in particular, given the challenges we're facing in our financial markets. So look forward to his testimony and to uh, hopefully our successful movement of his legislation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. I now would like uh, to welcome the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Townsend, who decided to come and sit in with us, our first hearing, and would you like to make a statement? Not working. He lights there. Yeah, right. Let me um, say, first of all, I think this is, um, I want to congratulate you, and I want to say that I think this is the best subcommittee of all. I want you to know that. <laughs> Because this is the one that, of course, uh, I was ranking on, and uh, and of course, uh, the one I had an opportunity to chair as well, and I had an opportunity to work with Congressman Platts uh, you know, on many, many issues. So I just want to say, uh, Madam Chair, I look forward to working with you, and I would just like to yield back and wait to hear from Congressman Larson. Thank you so much. Let me call our committee to order, and we are honored to have with us as our first witness, the Honorable John Larson. And thank you for your patience. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Chairman Towns, as well, and uh, Bill Bray, Mr. Cuellar, Mr. Platts. Is it on now? Uh, so let me thank you all again uh, for this um, opportunity. And most importantly, let me thank your committee. As I think the chair adequately and eloquently stated at the outset for the work that you have done, the fine legislation that you produced and that uh, Jim Cooper was a part of, um, and uh, the pleasure of working with Ed Towns and the committee in terms of shaping this current legislation, H.R. 885, that uh, we have before you. I. Uh, would like to by uh, quickly, uh, you know, uh, if the chair would agree, I'd like to submit uh, testimony from the public citizen in support of this legislation, and also uh, would like to revise and extend my remarks and submit my testimony and summarize if I can. So, uh, any questions that you might have, we can get those to those as quickly as possible. Uh, the need for this arose as we dealt with the issue of speculation more than a year ago in a nonpartisan basis again recognizing the increased need for oversight and review. It was pointed out at the time that the CFTC did not have, uh, it had an inspector general, but it did not have independent status. That individual was hired by and reported directly to the CFTC. This committee waived jurisdiction, but broadly supported it, and this was taken to the floor and passed overwhelmingly, nonpartisanly, unfortunately, was not taken up in the Senate. Upon discussion with Mr. Towns earlier this year and with his staff, he said, you know, this, this goes beyond the CFTC, and if we look at the kind of troubled waters, as Chairman Watson pointed out, uh, that we find ourselves in today with all of these financial uh, institutions and the ramifications therein became apparent uh, to me and I think uh, certainly to this committee, Mr. Towns, that there was a need for us to make sure that our inspector generals 
a law that was first adopted in 1978, upgraded last year by this committee, we further augment and bolster their responsibility and the credibility with the American public to make sure that inspector generals in those critical agencies had independent status. Now under that legislation, there are two types of IGs. One under section three that has independent status. By that, they are appointed by the president and confirmed by the United States Senate. Under section eight, uh, IGs also exist, but in this case, they are uh, appointed by the president of the agency, the governing entity of the agency, and serve at the bequest of that. I think especially uh, in these troubled times and with the problems that we face only exponentially growing, and the desire on the public to make sure, especially as it relates to governmental entities, that they are doing their responsibility of oversight and review, which of course this committee is specifically uh, charged with. So this legislation is very uh, simple. It says that uh, we need to focus on the five agencies that have direct involvement in making sure that they are involved with the oversight of our financial institutions. Uh, both the Commodities and Financial Markets, the CFT, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve, the National Credit Union Administration, and the uh, Pension Guarantee Benefit Fund. All uh, need to, uh, uh, and the Securities Exchange Commission, all need to come under this kind of independent uh, scrutiny that I think everyone in the United States Congress wants to see. And all this bill does is augment the fine work that you've already done by giving them that kind of status that already exists in the law under uh, Section uh, 3 of that code. That would make these inspector generals independent in status. It would expand their scope and their independence and give them additional resources. This committee went a long way towards providing resources last year and understood this early on. This gives added importance and independence in this day and age. Now, how do I know that we need that and what kind of information do we have to back that up? We all know and can feel in our gut that intuitively this makes sense, but in fact we had the, the Congressional Research Service do a study. And what that study showed was very clear. That amongst agencies that have an independent inspector general appointed by the president and approved by the Senate, they are involved in more than 117 ongoing audits and investigations. Amongst their same counterparts who are not appointed by the president but appointed by the agency and work at the agency, they have currently done 12 and have 11 that are under review. So in the case of independent inspector generals appointed by the president, approved by the Senate, they do 10 times as many audits and reviews. At a time when every economist, every pundit, everyone who's looking at this situation says what we need and what we've needed all along is to make sure that we had greater oversight and review. I think this speaks volumes uh, to the necessity uh, for this legislation. It is my hope, along with Mr. Platts, so I was happy to hear him say that, and in working with Mr. Towns, that we can expedite this legislative process that I believe could probably be put on our consent calendar uh, because of its nature and the gravity of the situation as Chairwoman uh, Watson has pointed out. I look forward to working uh, with Chairman Towns. Thank him for his help and support without his committee's aid and it was at their suggestion, I might add, that we look into expanding this uh, because they had already done such a thorough job uh, with the Cooper legislation last year. And with that, I'll yield back the balance of my time and submit to any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Congressman. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you so much. And uh, this concludes uh, the Congressman's uh, testimony. 
And uh, if any of the members would like uh, to raise a question, we'll take about five minutes for questions and to call to the floor. So again, I must apologize. My, uh, I will recess for a time for us to go to the floor and vote, and then we'll come back here and we'll go on with our panels. So are there any questions of committee members? Not, not a question, not a question, but I'd just like to assure him that I look forward to working with him to make certain that we move this legislation forward. I think it's very, very much needed, and of course I agree with you. I think it's something that we should be able to get on the consent calendar. Yeah, I appreciate appreciate the um, the item. Um, let me just, let me just say right off. One of the independent auditors is handling the uh, international development, the Agency for International Development. I'll just tell you as one. I've talked to the chairman about that. There's an agency that I think hasn't had enough auditing. I think in Afghanistan, the big scandal is not going to be what's happened with the war, but what hasn't happened with economic development. Um, and with your encouragement of going from a, a few agencies to a larger or um, would you just discuss the aspect of rather than proving expanding it in an evolutionary, now it's been kind of encouraged to be revolutionary and sort of be much broader originally. Is there a degree of discomfort for the fact that we may regret that we haven't done one or the other, done one first and then phased in the next? Well, I think it's. Chairman's uh, led me astray too, so don't let me get to get your. Uh, I think the. Uh, I think this would uh, be what uh, President Obama has called the fierce urgency of now, uh, and as uh, Chairwoman Watson pointed out, the severity of the t of the times we find ourselves in, and indeed, in uncharted in uncharted waters, and the need for us to have um, more expertise more oversight and uh, more independent hands uh, on the wheel. And whether it was benign neglect or whether it was someone as, uh, asleep at the switch, uh, I think the American public has uh, demanded uh, that we have this kind of independent oversight and review. Whereas my grandfather Nolan used to say, trust everyone but cut the cards. Well, let me, let me just say that um you know, they, there was that old saying that if you can keep your, your head cool and calm while everybody else is losing, you obviously don't understand the magnitude of the problem. <laughs> but I, I, dirty little secret is everybody knows I surf, but they don't know I do a lot of sailing. And I remember somebody who was sailing in Mexico with me one time said, you know we're, when we're in trouble and when we're in danger when Brian is quiet and introverted. Okay, I think sometimes keeping cool and not panicking, not just doing something is a very important part of a crisis. I just want to make sure we, we, we make a diligent step here um, because I do worry about how quickly we are jumping to things because of the crisis. And remember, uh, the line, you, you've got to do something, is what one lemming says to the other before jumping off a cliff. So I want to make sure that we do have that. I think that you've got a good, sound proposal here I just think that those of us, by definition, on oversight, has to make sure that it's not a cliff, but actually a step up to in, in the direction we want to go. And I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you. We're now going to take a brief recess. We'll reconvene. I imagine it'll be around uh, 3 30. So uh, thank you so very much. And, uh, Mr. Larkin, I thank the chair, I thank the ranking member, and I thank our distinguished chair and all the committee members for their time.
We're now uh, going to start with the second panel, and it's a policy of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform to swear in all witnesses before they testify. And I'd like to ask those, uh, Mr. Clippinger, I think you're the first in this set to rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. I now would like to introduce Mr. Gary L. Kepling. Is it Keplinger or Kepplinger? Either one will do, <laughs> Madam Chairman. Keplinger works. Okay. Uh, who serves as the Consul General of the Government Accountability Office. Prior to his appointment in 2006, he served as Deputy General Consul and Managing Associate General Consul in charge of accounting, appropriations, information management, and special investigation matters. And uh, I ask that the current witness give a brief summary of your testimony and keep this summary, if you can, under five minutes in duration. Your complete written statement will be included in the hearing record. Thank you, and you can get started. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairwoman. It's always a challenge for me to stay under five minutes, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Um, uh, our nation is currently in the midst of one of the worst financial crises since the Great Depression. As we recently reported, the current U.S. financial regulatory system has relied on a fragmented and complex arrangement of federal and state regulators that has not kept pace with major developments in financial markets and products, let alone with their associated risks. It is now quite apparent that the U.S. financial regulatory system is ill-suited to meet the nation's needs in the 21st century, and significant reforms are critically needed. Both the Congress and the administration are considering a number of options aimed at strengthening the financial regulatory system to reduce the likelihood that the nation will experience a similar financial crisis in the future. Effective oversight is an important part of any consideration in modernizing our current outdated system. H.R. 885, the Improved Financial and Commodity Markets Oversight and Accountability Act, would provide for the inspectors general at selected financial regulatory agencies, namely Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, Commodities Future Trading Commission, NACUA, National Credit Union Administration, Penny Benny, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, and the Securities and Exchange Commission to be appointed by the President with Senate confirmation. These IGs are currently appointed by their agency heads and can be removed by their agency heads with advance notification to the Congress. In our opinion, H.R. 885 would enhance the independence of these IGs, either under the current financial regulatory system or a modernized system. In the past, Congress has taken actions to convert IGs from appointment by their agency heads to appointment by the President as a way to enhance independence. The heels of the savings and loan and banking crisis two decades ago, Congress converted the IG at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation from agency appointment to appointment by the President due to the perceived limitation of the IG's independence resulting from the appointment process. In another example, Congress converted the Tennessee Valley Authority IG from appointment by the agency head to appointment by the president because of concerns about management interference with the IG's oversight. And there are others. In both of the examples I, I uh, talked about, Congress recognized that changes in the, in the appointment of the IGs would enhance their independence. As we've noted in prior reports and testimony, independence is one of the most important elements of an effective IG function. Professional auditing standards, the generally accepted government auditing standards, GAGAS, that were issued by the Controller General, recognize that audit organizations located in government entities, including IGs appointed by their agency heads, can meet the requirement for organizational independence. 
Much of the IG Act provides specific protections for IGs to ensure that the audit and investigative functions located within the agency being reviewed is insulated from inappropriate management pressure. However, the difference in the appointment and removal processes between presidentially appointed IGs and those appointed by their agency heads results in a clear difference in the level of IG organizational independence. In this regard, I think we would all agree with the common sense proposition that the further removed the appointment source is from the entity to be audited, the greater the level of independence. And I think the flip of that is similar with respect to the removal authority. The recently enacted IG Reform Act of 2008 amends the IG Act to further enhance the independence of the IG. The agency appointed IGs will now be required to be selected without regard to political affiliation and solely on the basis of integrity and defined abilities, just like IGs appointed by the President. In addition, the Reform Act enhances the independence of the IGs by requiring notification to the Congress of the reasons for an IG removal or transfer at least 30 days prior to any such action rather than after the fact notification. The Reform Act also created the Council of IGs on Integrity and, and Efficiency to replace the administratively creative councils uh, that governed the presidential uh, appointed IGs and those that were agency heads. The new IG Council is expected to aid the IG community and foster government-wide efforts to coordinate and improve IG oversight. Currently, considerable debate is underway over whether and how current financial regulatory systems should be changed, including calls for consolidating regulatory agencies, broadening certain regulators' authorities, or subjecting certain products or entities to more regulation. A strong, independent, and coordinated IG oversight and accountability function should be an important element of this reform. It's the end of my statement. I'd be happy to take any questions, Madam Chair. We are attempting, as you have heard, to really improve the efficacy of this particular position. Is there anything else that you would suggest to make this a more independent agency and a more reliable one? Because it's all going to come down with uh, your evaluations and your recommendations. So what are we missing that you would like to see? We have approached the issue also uh, from a slightly different perspective. A number of the uh, uh, IGs, uh, CFTC, um, uh, uh, CC, I think they're relatively small in size. And w another approach would be to consolidate those audit functions in Presidential, existing presidentially appointed IGs. Uh, we had uh, uh, offered uh, the concept before that you could uh, make CFTC and SEC part of the Treasury IG and the NACUA uh, part of the FDIC IG's office and Penny Benny as part of the Department of Labor IG office. Those were all presidentially appointed IGs. We had in the past recommended that the IG at the Federal Reserve be presidentially appointed because of the significance of the functions and the activities of that agency and its size. What bothers me is the politicizing of the IG reports and also the fact that the ideology from the administration is part and parcel of the IG's function and office. So when you say political appointment, how can we guard against politicizing that particular position and uh, the ideology that that person might carry that lines itself with the president? It, uh, uh, I'm a lawyer. I, I, I approach things as a lawyer, I would note that both with respect to the DFEs as a result of uh, uh, your colleague, Mr. Cooper, and uh, Senator McCaskill,